You know, just the first few bars of that tune, it strikes fear into the heart of just about every saxophone player. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's because this is coming up next. I've got something really special for you today though, because inside Sax School Pro, we've just released a brand new course all about giant steps. And I want to share the first lesson from that whole course with you today. Now, even if you've got zero interest in playing a solo like John Coltrane, this is a really important song for you to know because there's so much stuff that you'll learn in the melody and the harmony of giant steps that'll really help you to play saxophone better. So it was Joel Pinnell from the Tudor team that filmed this course. And actually a lot of the stuff he talks about in this course is the stuff that he teaches his students over at the Leeds Conservatorium here in the UK. So it's packed with a load of great information. But in this very first lesson, Joel is teaching you how to play the melody and he's using a really cool technique actually to break it down and make it really memorable. So let's dig into the lesson now where you're gonna learn how to play the melody for giant steps and I'll catch you at the end. <laughs> So before we get into it, don't be worried about giant steps. It's one of those tunes that everyone talks about like it's almost impossible, a godlike tune if you're able to play it, but it's just not the case. Actually, it's really simple. The melody is really easy to learn. It's not got any complicated rhythms in it or complicated notes. And in fact, it's made up of just three shapes, two of which are played in two keys. So that's all we need to learn for the tune. And also when it comes to the improvisation, which we'll look at in further lessons, actually all you need to play is three major scales. And also if you're familiar from a harmony point of view, just with three two five ones, that's all that's in giant steps. So actually less material and less scales than in many other standards that we've already looked at and that come up every day and are considered to be easier standards. Now, the reason I think that Giant Steps is considered to be a difficult tune is simply because it's generally played so fast. Now, one thing I would say with that is any tune that you play at 290 beats per minute is going to be difficult. However, we don't have to play Giant Steps at 290 beats per minute like John Coltrane did. We can play it slower, and there's nothing wrong with that. At the end of the day, this is jazz. It's a very personal endeavour. And if we want to play a tune slower than the original recorder or fasting than the original recording, or we can change the style. I might want to play it as a Latin. And in fact, I do sometimes play Giant Steps as a medium tempo Latin. It sounds great. I think one of the things as well is if you do try and replicate the original, with a tune like this, it's so well known and the solo is so well known that you're always fighting a losing battle, basically, because it'll always be in the listener's mind, that Coltrane solo. And whether you do a better solo than Coltrane, and, you know, good luck to us all with that, or, you know, you do a totally different one, it's just in their mind. So actually by changing the arrangement, then you can escape that trap, if you like, and the, the listener will hear it in a new way. And that's always a really good thing to do with repertoire. It's totally up to us. So even though you may see tempo markings on certain pieces of music, you don't have to play them at that tempo. It's purely a suggestion. In the same way as we often interpret melodies and we interpret harmony in our own way, because we're jazz improvisers, it's a very personal pursuit. And that's absolutely fine to do. <laughs> So let's get into the melody. So like I said, there's only three shapes we need to learn to learn this entire melody. It's a 16 bar melody. So two of the shapes we're gonna to have to learn in two keys, and one shape we only need to learn in one key. Put them all together in a very specific way, and we've got the entire 16 bar tune that is giant steps. So let's have a look at the first shape. So basically the first shape is a major seven shape and it's descending so it comes down seven major seven five three one and then it goes up to the flat three the minor third so in the key of c that would be for example b g e c e flat simple as that now, the first shape we need to learn in the tenor key will be an A major 7 shape going to the minor 3rd, and on alto it's going to be an E major shape going
going to the minor third. So on tenor, that's going to be G sharp, E, C sharp, A, and up to the C, the minor third. And on alto, that's going to be D sharp, B, G sharp, E, and up to G, natural, the minor third. So let's try that right now. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Let's try that once more. Two, three, four. Okay, pretty simple shape. So let's do it in the other key we're going to need it to, to be able to do it in. So for tenor players, this is going to be an F major 7 shape. And for alto players, this is going to be a C major 7 shape, both once again, going up to that minor third. So on tenor, that's going to be E, C, A, F, and up to the A flat, that minor third. And on alto, that's going to be B, G, E, C, and up to the E flat, the minor third. So let's try that together. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Let's try that once more. One, two, three, four. Okay, so we've done quite a big lump of the tune there. So next, let's have a look at our second shape. And there's a few ways of looking at this shape. So if you're familiar with minor pentatonics, so a minor pentatonic is one, flat three, four, five, flat seven. Uh, if you've ever dealt with those, it's exactly the same as a major pentatonic. It just starts on a different note. So for example, C sharp minor pentatonic is the same as the relative major E major pentatonic. It's the same series of notes. It just has a different start point. It's a different mode of the pentatonic, a different starting note. Okay, so one way of looking at this shape is we're gonna go one, flat seven, up to flat three. So that's one way of looking at it. So in the key of C sharp minor pentatonic, that would be C sharp, the root, B, the flat seven, and E, the flat third. So there's one way of looking at the shape. A secondary way would be to look at it from the major pentatonic, E major pentatonic, if we're looking at the same one, and that would be going six, five, one. So C sharp being the six, B being the 5 and E being the 1. And the third way I'm going to give you to look at it is you can just look at it as going down a tone, so C sharp to B, and up a fourth, so B to E. So there's three different ways of looking at it. And when it comes to stuff like this, there's not a better way of doing it. We're all different. Some of us are quite mathematical. Some of us prefer to think about structures we already know or equate it to a, maybe a tune or a melody we've already learned. It really doesn't matter which way you think about it. All that matters is that you get it right. And no one cares how you think about it. If it works for you, it works for you. I think about some things in very strange ways, ways I'd never teach them because they probably won't make sense to other people because they're built on very personal experiences. Uh, things that I've played before or things that I've learned before and I'm reusing that information to remember a new thing. And that's completely valid. So it's worth trying out several methods when you're trying to memorise something. And you'll find that one of them just jumps to mind quicker than the others. And that's the one for you. And you can use that information and try and reuse that method when you come to learning something new. It's a really useful way of working. OK, so let's have a look at this second shape. So however we're going to think about it, I'm going to talk about it as a minor pentatonic today. So the first one is going to start and be based on C-sharp minor pentatonic, which is going to be G-sharp uh, minor pentatonic for alto players. And on tenor, this is going to go C-sharp, B, E. And for alto players, this is going to go G-sharp, F-sharp, B. So let's try those three notes. So one, two, three, four. <laughs> Try again. Two, three, four. Mm -hmm. 
we're going to do this shape again, once again, in a different key. So this time for tenor players, it's going to be based on the A minor pentatonic. And for alto players, it's going to be the E minor pentatonic. So the notes for tenor would be A, G, C. And the notes for alto would be E, D, G. So let's try that. Two, three, four. And again, two, three, four. Okay, so we've got one more shape to learn. And this is based on the F triad. So just the basic three notes of an F triad for tenor and a C triad for alto. So we're going to play it in a slightly weird way. We're almost going to merge together both a major and a minor triad. So the first two notes are going to be from the minor triad. So on tenor, that's going to be F and A flat. And on alto, that's going to be C and E flat. And then the second part of it is going to be based on the second two notes of the major triad. So for tenor, F major triad, it's going to be A and C. And for alto, that's going to be E and G. And then we're going to come back down to the minor third of the minor triad. So for alto, that would be E flat. And for tenor, that would be A flat. So the whole thing on tenor would be F, the root, A flat, that flat third from the minor triad, then A, the major third from that triad, then C, the fifth from both triads, and then back down to the minor third, A flat. So F, A flat, A, C, A flat. And for alto players, same thing, except you're doing it in C. So you'd have C, E flat, E, G, back down to that minor third, E flat. Okay, so F, A flat, A, C, A flat for tenor, and C, E flat, E, G, E flat for altos. So let's try that. Two, three, four. <laughs> Uh, let's try it again. Two, three, four. Okay, so now we've actually learned all the parts of this melody. Now we just need to work out how to fit them all together. So it starts off with the first descending major seven shape we looked at. That was A major seven shape for tenor and an E major seven shape for alto going up to that minor third. Okay, so we'll start off with that. So here we go, two, three, four. Okay, now nearly always the link in this tune is to go up a semitone from the final note of the phrase and then play the next group we've looked at starting on that note. So here on tenor, we've gone G sharp, E, C sharp, A, C. And we're going to go up a semitone to the C sharp. And then we're going to play the second little group we looked at. So that would be C sharp, B, E on tenor. And that would be G sharp, F sharp, B on alto. So from the beginning, two, three, four. <laughs> Up a semitone. And what you'll notice when you get to the end of that little second grouping we've looked at, you're on the first note of the next descending major seven shape, which for tenor players was an F major seven shape, going up to the minor third at the end. And for alto players was a C major seven shape, going up to the minor third at the end, E flat again. So let's put all that together. So we've got Two, three, four. Okay, and at this point, once again, we go up a semitone. So I've landed on the note A flat there on tenor or E flat on alto. We're going to go up a semitone to the note E which is the beginning of one of our second groupings again. And we're going to play that grouping. So for tenor, this is A, G, C. And for alto, this is E, D, G. So let's see where we're up to there. 
So, two, three, four. Upper semitone. Then we go up another semitone from that final note and we're back to the first of the second two groupings we played, the C sharp pentatonic one or the G sharp pentatonic one. And then we go up another semitone and you'll find that you've landed on the root of the third group we looked at. And this is played with a slightly different rhythm, so the first note's played twice each time, so... Hopefully you can hear how I've linked those together. So let's put the whole thing together. So we're not playing it with the, the rhythms yet, though there's not many rhythms in this tune. Uh, we're just playing it just as a series of notes and just thinking of it, think of it like Lego. I like to think of all music like Lego. It's a load of different Lego bricks. So let's say you bought a Lego boat and you built the boat and you've got bored of it and you've took all the Lego to bits and you now you've got lots of different building blocks. There's still those same building blocks, except now we can put them together in different orders. And actually, that's the difficult thing. You can think about this from the point of view of technique. For example, if you've played every interval uh, in your scales, you've played every fundamental Lego brick of music. Uh, and then all music is just putting those Lego bricks back together in a different way, building something new. I'll build a house out of a Lego that was originally a boat, for example. And so you can really break things down to this almost atomic level, if you like. So these Lego bricks of music, so whether they're technical or musical, you'll find the same things cropping up again and again, but then they're put together in a different order. And actually, that's the difficult bit to remember. And that's why little bullet points like remembering to go up a semitone can be really useful. I do that, I go up a semitone, I do that block. I go up a semitone, I do that block, for example. And if you think about, here's a weird analogy for you. So if you think about one of those old game shows where at the end they used to have the conveyor belt came out with all the different prizes on there, all those prizes were familiar Lego brocks. It was a washing machine or a cabbage or, you know, a dishwasher or whatever it was. You recognise the individual blocks, but the challenge of the game was to remember the order of them. And that's a little bit more difficult. And we need bullet points. We need some kind of story to connect them. And in the case of Giant Steps, it's nearly always go up a semitone and play the next Lego brick. So let's put all that together. So we've got the major seven shape going up to that minor third. Then we go up a semitone and we play the first of the second groups. That lands us on the first note of our second major seven downwards group. We go down that and up to the minor third. Then we go up a semitone and we play the second of the second group. Then we go up a semitone and we play the first of the second group. Then we go up a semitone and we spread out this third group. Ba, 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 up to the minor third and then up to the major third. Ba, 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 up to the fifth and then back down to the minor third for the third phrase. So let's put all those notes together. So two, three, four. <laughs> That's the whole tune. Now we need to be familiar with the rhythm and there's no better way of doing that than just listening to the melody on the recording a few times. That's the best way of getting rhythms in your head, particularly if you're not a keen reader. They'll go in, you've got these series of little shapes and you just apply that rhythm from, from memory. Uh, and that's a great way of learning tunes as well. So that's something I'd definitely advise. And I know we talk about that all the time in the spotlight sessions with Fred and Chris and Nigel. We're always saying about how important it is to listen to the tune because it really aids memorization. So now we've got all those building blocks, let's play it in time with the backing track. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> 
So I hope you found that okay. It's a really simple tune, there's barely any rhythms in there, and as always there's room for interpretation even of those rhythms in the way that you want to play it. In the versions we're about to listen to uh, of various players playing it, you're going to notice lots of different things. You're going to notice that some of them play at different tempos, some of them add extra bits to the arrangement, maybe extra chords or extra bars or vamps. Some of them change the rhythm of the tune. So once again, going back to what I said earlier, you know, that personalization and sometimes getting away from the rhythm uh, and the original versions of these tunes isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's a great thing for individuality. And at the end of the day, remember this is improvisation, including the melody to some degree. And we can do whatever we like with it. Uh, that's the whole point in jazz. It's our interpretation of repertoire. And remember that all written music, including tempo markings, dynamic markings in jazz, these lead sheets that we see are just there as an editor's guide. It's their interpretation of the tune. It doesn't necessarily have to be ours. Our job is to interpret it and make it our own. How awesome was that? Did you enjoy that lesson? Do you like the way that Joel breaks down the melody like that? Because I find it really helpful for memorizing a melody and really internalizing it quickly. So if you like that kind of thing, let me know in a comment down below. Now, the fact that you stuck around to the end of the video tells me that you are really into this sort of music and you love to learn more. So I think you'd really enjoy the rest of the course from Joel, which is inside Satsical Pro. And in the rest of the course, Joel digs into a bunch of different examples of how this tune's performed, and then he breaks down the harmony into really simple steps. This is the thing I love the most. He shows how you can, you can improvise over giant steps with just three scales, which is brilliant. So he gives you a load of really clear tactics, and by the end of the course, and it's like quite a long course actually, there's uh, so much information and simple strategies in there that you can really easily improvise over this tune that most people think is almost impossible. So I think you're absolutely going to love it. The feedback from our members inside Sat School has been absolutely amazing. So right now you can actually go check that out with a 14-day trial. It's still active as, as I'm filming this video, and you can get the 14-day trial by going to the courses page of satschoolonline.com or look for the link down below. I'd really love to see you in there. There's so much other stuff as well as this course from Joel, including lessons on other styles like classical, jazz, uh, straight ahead jazz, funk, smooth jazz, pop, blues, ska, pretty much anything you want to learn. We've got courses and lessons to help you, and of course, a massive tutor team to guide you along the way too. So I'd love to see you inside Saskal Pro, but most importantly, keep digging into the resources on the channel here. Here's a couple of other lessons that you could look at next, and keep having fun on your saxophone. I'll catch you next time.